Now for today's webinar, again, the title, Emerging Leaders, How Trainees Are Using the CLSA Platform for Research on Health and Aging. I'd like to introduce our panelists, Dr. Matilda Saliba, uh, Vrati Me uh, Mera, Mera, I said that wrong, I'm sorry, and, and Doa Farid. So Dr. Saliba is the CLSA Data Access Officer. She coordinates the feasibility review of data and sample access applications with the CLSA, the release of data sets of approved users, uh, communication of data release updates, and responses to access queries from approved users and potential data access applicants. She also ensures uh, providing Canadian and international research community with up-to-date information on the availability, use, and access of CLSA data. Uh, she has over 15 years of experience in coordinating health research projects prior to joining the CLSA, um, and she's been here four or five months now. She worked as the National Access Coordinator for the Canadian Partnership for Tomorrow's Project and Data Harmonization Manager with Maelstrom Research Group at the Research Institute at McGill University Health Center. Uh, Dr. Saliba holds a PhD in epidemiology from London South Bank University in the UK and a Master of Science in Population Health from the American University of Beirut in Lebanon. Uh, next, we have uh, Vrati Mera. Uh, is currently, she's currently an MD candidate at, York, at University of Toronto. Uh, she recently completed her Master's in Epidemiology at York under the supervision of Dr. Hala Tamim. Uh, Vrati has won many awards for her research, including the CIHR Canada Graduate Scholarship, um, Ontario Graduate Scholarship, and the LaMarche Graduate Research Award. And finally, we have Doa Farid, who is a clinical dietitian and PhD candidate in the Department of Family Medicine and Primary Health Care Research at McGill. She earned her undergraduate degree in dietetics and human nutrition at McGill and her master's in nutritional epidemiology at Boston University. Her research interest lies in minority health, nutrition, predictors of health, inequities, obesity, and diabetes. Doa has received several awards for her research in inequities of health, such as the Patient's Choice Award and Greta Chambers Award. She enjoys exploring different cultures, sports, and learning languages during lockdown. Um, so I'll be curious to know how many languages you've actually uh, learned, Doa. Um, so those are our panelists today. I think we've got a great selection, and I'm very impressed with the uh, international uh, uh, stature of all of them. So uh, on that note, I will pass it over to Matilda. Yeah, thank you, Jennifer, and thanks to Vati and Dawa for presenting at this webinar. Uh, so this is a quick overview about what trainees should know before they prepare the CLS, CLS, CLSA data access application. So, yeah, I will provide a general overview um, of approved CLSA applications. So here uh, you can see the total number of applications per year where the blue parts can represent the trainees applications. So since uh, 2014, uh, we have more than 300 approved, uh, approved applications where if you notice there's more than one third of the, those applications are trainees applications. So, uh, CLSA is a multidisciplinary data has provided uh, the opportunity to many students and postdocs to use their, this data to their thesis as well as for their research project as postdoc fellows. So you can check uh, the CLSA website to know more about those approved projects. So, as a trainee, uh, what do you need to know? Uh, first, you can request a fee waiver if you're eligible. So, CLSA provides data at no cost if you're enrolled at a recognized institution in Canada or if you're a Canadian trainee based at institution outside Canada but funded to a Canadian source. Uh, bear in mind that uh, the data you request should only be used for your thesis research as part of your master's or PhD program or for your postdoc research project. 
there is a limit of one waiver per postdoc. Yeah, I just need to, okay. Um, so second, it's very important, and I stress on this point, that uh, you know how to assign the research team roles in your application. Uh, so the primary applicant should be the trainee supervisors and not the student or the postdoc. Um, although this is explicitly explained on Magnolia, uh, so we still get, I mean, Magnolia is, by the way, our online data access application system. So we still uh, receive applications with students uh, and postdoc assigned as the primary applicants. Although we do have an application in part one, a section specifically for trainees that uh, all the information should be identified here, as well as, as if you need to request a fee waiver, you need to check the box there. So once we receive a, like um, a misassigned uh, research team roles, we have to, in this case, ask again the supervisor to correct, to correct the information, review the application and submit again. So this could delay the process too. So uh, you need to know uh, that the supervisor on behalf of the trainee must request a user account on Magnolia uh, and they need to be responsible for the content of the application as well as submit the application. They also need to follow up on all correspondence with CLSA. Third, you need to be uh, mindful of the application process timeframe. So the application process usually entails several steps. Uh, so once you submit, uh, there is, uh, the, the application goes into administrative and feasibility review. So this step usually includes uh, like ensuring that the application is complete as well as the data is available. After the application proceeds to the data and access sample co uh, committee, uh, those are independent members um, that review the application, uh, the scientific background, rationale, objectives, as well as methods, and they provide their recommendations to the Celeste A scientific management team. Uh, the final decision is granted by the CLSA scientific management team and the applicant will be notified about either it's approved or it requires revisions or it's not approved. So for those uh, that are approved, the, uh, the next step would be the access agreement phase. So here is where the, I mean, where the access agreements are signed with your institutions and when you need to deal with your own ethics board to get the ethics approval. So we have absolutely no control over the steps and the time might vary from one institution to another. So once the agreement is signed and we receive the ethics approval, that then we can prepare and release the data. And usually this step takes around one week. So as a student I'm, who wants to use this data for um, the master's, uh, their master's thesis or PhD or postdoc, it's really important to think about the amount of time it takes. So you should um, plan on receiving the data about like six months after the submission deadline. Definitely, you need to know uh, when are the submission deadlines. So for 2021, we do have uh, two submission deadlines, one for April 14 and another for September 8. And usually you will be notified about the decision like after three months, if it's approved, not approved or, or requires revisions. Uh, tip number five, uh, you have to be certain of the CLSA variables you would need for your research. So it's important when you start thinking of using CLSA data to explore first the CLSA website. Uh, specifically for information under the researchers and the data access tab. So you will find there the protocols uh, which will give you an idea about the study design and the rationale. You'll also find the questionnaires, um, information on physical assessment there will be there, as well as there's data support documents, uh, like they describe in details different areas like cognitive data, environment data variables, as well as genetic data, etc. So to know 
um, what data are currently available, I highly recommend that you consult the CLSA data availability table, uh, which is under the data access section on, on the CLSA website. Keep in mind that we only accept applications for data that are available at the time of the submission. So, along with that, you can also uh, use the data preview portal that we have on our website. So, here uh, you can get some, um, like a very high level metadata as well as uh, variable specific information. So, this tool is very helpful, I, uh, I find, for if you want to look at a research question, for example, using CLSA data, and you need to make sure you have the numbers available to you, so then you can use this. Um, tool. So, and there is more, I mean, information on the website that explains in details how to navigate through this data preview portal. Uh, another tip here, uh, we do recommend that so you obtain ethics approval uh, the earliest possible. Although it's not required at the time of submission, ethical applications can take quite some time for certain institutions. So this could delay the process as we do not we do not release at all data until we receive proof of ethics. And um, finally, uh, so before you submit, ensure your application is complete and includes all necessary information. So please follow the instructions on Magnolia as well as uh, describe well your project by providing uh, the level of details you would normally provide in a grant application. Uh, make sure, I mean, that the, you'd select the variable modules in the data checklist that you would need for your research within the corresponding wave. So currently we do have now baseline and follow up one. Um, I do emphasize that the primary applicant, which is the student supervisor, reviews attentively uh, the application before submitting. We do receive some trainees applications uh, that are incomplete or um, include inadequate information where they're not sometimes not approved or sent back for revisions. And this really could delay the process. So supervisors, um, should use the CLSA data access application process as a valuable training tool to guide trainees in preparing the application. And as I said, uh, inadequate information can result in processing delays or refusal of an application. Uh, so to know more, I mean, about our data access uh, 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 process, so you can go uh, check the website under the data access section. There's a lot of information there. And uh, you also, I do recommend that you, you check the part on the FAQ section where there are a lot of questions are answer, answered here too. And definitely, I mean, if you have additional questions, you can always email us at access at CLSA-ELCV.ca. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matilda. So, um, I think we're going to reserve questions to the very end. Um, so we'll put your slide back later. Um, who I'm not sure actually if it's uh, Rati or Doa that's coming up. Next. Yes, me Jennifer. <laughs> okay, sorry. I was just hoping 1 of you would just just jump in. Um, okay, so you are you are up next. Um, I think you jumped slides. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, um, okay, <laughs> everybody got a glimpse of my slides. <laughs> so thank you all uh, thank you for the sales, CLC and sales a and the team and your team for inviting me to speak today. Uh, my name is Doa Farid, and I'm a clinical dietitian and PhD candidate at, the, at McGill University in the Department of Family Medicine and Primary Healthcare Research. Um, I'm co-supervised by Dr. Ilham Rahme and Dr. Kaberi Gdeskupta. 
And today I'm going to present uh, my analysis of undiagnosed depression, persistent, uh, persistent depressive symptoms, and seeking mental health care in immigrants and non-immigrants using the CLSA data. So I have no uh, conflict of interest disclosed right now. So before I start, I'm going to share with you a personal story. 15 years ago, I immigrated to Canada to study at McGill. This is beautiful McGill under the snow. Uh, I got married and got my first child. And as all of you know, that in Canada, when you deliver your baby, your first baby, they send you a public health nurse at home to check on you and teach you how to become a mother, let's say. Um, the public health nurse saw me uh, emotional and kind of sad and asked me whether everything was okay. And then I started to list all the things that were going wrong and so on. And to my surprise, she was able to kind of screen me on the spot on having early signs of postpartum depression. In that instance, this nurse uh, saved my life by reassuring me and lift me, lifting me up. Um, I realized how screening for depression was so important at that time and devoted my PhD in evaluating depression and seeking help. Uh, so here's a question for you guys. Um, to vote on your screens, please vote whether you have on the right on the right side. Please vote whether you have experienced uh, previously symptoms of mental illness or depression, regardless of COVID nineteen. Let's say. <laughs> so that's question number one. So, um, as you all know, depression is a leading cause of disability globally. Um, you know, uh, indeed, uh, we all know depression is serious. 6.7 million people in Canada have experienced a mental health problem or illness. It seems, though, that depression often goes undiagnosed and untreated, and this is what studies show. So, what happens if depression is left uh, undiagnosed? When it can affect it can affect basically your overall quality of life um your productivity you know here we see absenteeism how much it's affected as well during work physical illness you get you know you get physically ill um it also increases self-perceived functional uh, disability uh you, you get to feel paralyzed and it prevents you uh from seeking help and sometimes even suicide um, or suicide attempts. So here's another question uh, for all of you, two questions on, on this. Uh, so the next two questions, you probably voted already. Um, whether for those who had symptoms of depression previously, did you seek help for it or not at that time? Uh, the poll is on the right. And you can go ahead and answer question three as well. And, and why not? Is it because of time? Is it because of stigma? No social support around you or discrimination? Um, you weren't attached to a doctor, you couldn't find a doctor or other reasons. So, um, so what about immigrants in Canada? What happens to the health of immigrants after arrival? When they arrive, they are relatively healthier than the general population, uh, where they have better self-reported health, uh, low, lower use of health services. And this is what they used to call healthy immigrant effect and still call, they, they still call it healthy immigrant effect. Uh, however, this healthy immigrant effect declines with years lived in Canada when living more than five years they are twice as prone to report one of the seven most common chronic illnesses. Um, and, and we see it because of several reasons, like unemployment, lack of knowledge, lack of access of services, and so on. Uh, and because of so physical health deteriorates, but what, what about mental health? A lot of research is missing in this area. So um, we're, we're looking into that. How about uh, seeking help for immigrants. Well, 20% of immigrants report having barriers in accessing healthcare services. 
and 12 percent lo lower all-cause unmet needs than non-immigrants. So here's the questions that we're covering in this, re in this study, uh, uh, which was published uh, recently, not recently, a year ago, <laughs> but um, among, we wanted to see among older immigrants and non-immigrants who participated in the CLSA in the first uh, baseline comprehensive cohort, what is the prevalence of undiagnosed depression and what are the risk factors? Are, um, are length of residence or age at arrival important at all? What is the prevalence of persistence in depressive symptoms at 18 months? And what is the likelihood of seeing a mental health care professional for these uh, symptoms? Uh, so I'm going to discuss a bit of the methods. So as you all know, we use CLSA. As, as CLSA and the cohort selection, we use the baseline comprehensive cohort uh, around 30,000 people. And basically we exclude those with any mood disorders uh, in the last year, current antidepressant use or and missing information on the outcomes. Um, these are exclusion criteria. Uh, and at the end, we had around 23,000 uh, people. Our primary outcome that we looked at is the current screening of undiagnosed depression. And we use CSD-10, which is the Center for Epidemiological Studies uh, short uh, depression scale. Um, and basically it was, it's a widely validated tool uh, specifically for older adults. And we can see here the sensitivity and uh, predictive value. But this is how the CSD looks like. Uh, they ask you a few questions and you get to uh, so the first question, like, I was bo bothered by things that usually don't bother me. I think everybody's like that during COVID now. I had trouble keeping my mind on what I was doing. You know, I felt depressed and so on. So uh, this was our first outcome. Our second outcome, secondary outcome was at 18 months where we looked at a second scale uh, called Kessler's psychological distress scale, short for K10. And it basically measures not specific psychological the stress and predict uh, diagnosis for mental illness. And this is how the K10 looks like. We use a cutoff of 19, uh, where it was found to balance sensitivity and specificity as well, and was used in other studies. So our third, uh, under the secondary outcome, we looked at a secondary question in the K10, where they ask here in the last, uh, before the last question, they ask uh, whether they've seen uh, a doctor for these symptoms of symptoms of you know uh, feeling lonely, feeling and so on. If, whether if they uh, uh, sought help or not, uh, we we also um, looked at we adjusted for population characteristics and health behavior using the Anderson model for uh, uh, utilization for healthcare utilization. So we looked at several characteristics here that we adjusted for. In terms of analysis, we did descriptive statistics with means and standard deviation. Um, multiple logistic regression models were used to examine the association between immigrant and mental health with our primary outcome, which is undiagnosed depression with the CSD. CSD. And the secondary outcome, uh, persistent depressive symptom, which we'll look at model two, and seeing a mental health care professional for these symptoms, uh, uh, which is model three. So here's a glimpse of the results, uh, weighted crude results for our primary outcome were that around 10.9% were undiagnosed, the undiagnosed depressed, the, had undiagnosed depression at baseline, 19.1% had immigrated to Canada, and the majority of, had lived in Canada over 20 years uh, ago. So they're actually used to Canada and they've been here, <laughs> they've been in Canada for a long time. Our secondary outcome, 32% uh, had depressive symptoms at 18 months, uh, of whom 15.5%, only 15.5% had seen a mental health care professional in the previous month, which is a very small number. Uh, here's some more crude results uh, where we actually looked at immigrants versus non-immigrants who were more likely to be older, former or non-smoker, married, uh, you know, more educated, unemployed, male to have a low income of less than $20,000 and live in an urban setting. Immigrants are less likely to have bowel disorders, have cancer, overweight, be overweight or obese. 
So uh, here's our first question in our first model. What is the likelihood of having undiagnosed depression in immigrants and non-immigrants? Um, we found an interaction between uh, immigration status and sex, uh, where we found that among men, immigration status was not associated with depression at all. However, among women, immigrants were 50% more likely to have depression. Women were consistently, consistently more likely to be depressed than men. Um, and uh, age at arrival or length, length of residence uh, as a risk factor, we did find that immigrants who arrived at age 40 and above were twice as likely as non-immigrants to have undiagnosed depression. So if they immigrated at a later stage, it's harder for them to adapt. Uh, immigrants who resided in Canada for less than 20 years or above 40 years were more likely than non-immigrants to have undiagnosed depression. In terms of the likelihood of having persistent depressive symptoms after 18 months, we found no difference uh, between immigrants and non-immigrants, regardless of undiagnosed depression at baseline. So, uh, and among those without undiagnosed depression, Female, females were at increased risk of having depressive symptoms versus males. But among those with undiagnosed depression at baseline, the risk of depressive symptoms and persistent depressive symptoms was not different between females and males. In terms of the likelihood of seeing a mental health care professional, which is very important to seek help, um, there was no difference between immigrants and non-immigrants. Um, and females were actually more likely to see mental health care for practitioners. And those who had persistence in depressive symptoms, so they had undiagnosed depression at baseline, and then we saw them with the K-10 having depressive uh, symptoms at 18 months, were three times more likely compared to those uh, with undiagnosed depression at baseline to see a mental health care professional. So here's uh, some take home messages for you. Screening particularly uh, benefits immigrants who arrived at 40 years of age and older and for everybody, and more specifically those of female sex. Uh, Follow-up screening should query persistence of depressive symptoms and encourage seeking mental health care regardless of immigration uh, status. Um, here's our, uh, pub uh, the results are published uh, in the Epidemiology and Psychiatric Sciences. And um, we were happy uh, two weeks ago, we were awarded uh, the Raksha Award for best article of the year by the Réseau Québécois sur le suicide, les troubles de l'humeur et les troubles associés. Donc, uh, donc je suis, on est très heureux par rapport à ça. Uh, I switched to French. So I will actually present the results of the poll right now, uh, if Shirley can help us. So yes, 34% of uh, our participants had symptoms of mental illness or depression. Um, and then for those who had symptoms of mental depression, did they seek help? 50%, 15% said yes and 15% said no, if I'm reading the poll right. <laughs> and then the last question is, that mostly, um, uh, I guess, time, finding time to, to, seeking, uh, to seeking help. So thank you so much, everybody, for answering the poll questions. Uh, I would like to thank my uh, supervisors, Dr. Elham Rahme and uh, Dr. Kaberi Daskupta, and my thesis committee and the Department of Family Medicine and Primary Healthcare Research. Uh, the, the award I received from the Fonds de Recherche Santé Québec and Dialogue McGill and the Institute for Health and Social Policy for their support as well. Uh, if, uh, if you have any further questions, please do contact me through this email. Thank you. Well, thank you so much and congratulations on your on your work both clinically as well as uh, the research work that you've done. It's very exciting um, and I think it's a great example of uh, CLSA trainees. Um, so now we'll have another great example of uh, CLSA trainees using uh, data and I'll turn it over to Rati. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, oops, I'm just trying to navigate to my slides. Okay, perfect. 
Um, so thank you CLSA for inviting me for this talk. Uh, it's an honor. Um, my name is Brati, uh, and we used CLSA data uh, for our study to look at the association between diabetes type, age of onset, and age of natural menopause, and this was a retrospective cohort study. So just to get us started and on the same sort of page, um, I wanted to go over the three different types of diabetes. So type 1 diabetes is a chronic condition in which your body is no longer able to produce insulin. It's an autoimmune condition. Um, type 2 diabetes is when the body becomes unresponsive to the insulin. Uh, and so the organs, the primary organs that are responsible for uptaking glucose are no longer able to do so. Uh, this has both genetic and environmental risk factors. Gestational diabetes, on the other hand, is when a female um, who was non-diabetic develops diabetes during her pregnancy. So, some stats to get us started. Um, in 2017, more than 476 million people lived with diabetes across the globe. In Canada, in the same year, 2.3 million people reported being diagnosed with diabetes. And although the um, risk factors uh, among males and females are similar, uh, there are some differences. And so among females, uh, it's actually found that upon diagnosis of diabetes, they have a lower um, uh, socioeconomic status, lower education status, and higher BMI. And then in terms of the clinical impact of diabetes, it's actually been seen that women have a sevenfold greater risk of developing cardiovascular diseases after their diagnosis of diabetes, compared to just a threefold greater risk in men. And this also translates to greater uh, cardiovascular mortality among females as compared to their male counterparts. So that's what I just reviewed. Um, so menopause. Uh, oh, sorry, actually, let's go back. <laughs> um, so why look at diabetes in women? So with increased prevalence across all age groups, more women are expected to spend a greater portion of their reproductive years living with diabetes, which then makes it important for us to understand um, the impact of diabetes on women's long-term reproductive health. And one such indicator is actually menopause. Um, so menopause is the age at which a woman experiences, age at natural menopause, uh, is the age at which a woman experiences 12 consecutive months of amenorrhea. The average age at natural menopause can range anywhere between 46 to 52 years. And so why do we look at menopause? Well, it's been seen that early menopause can actually place um, women at a greater risk of negative health outcomes, including greater risk of fractures, greater risk of cardiovascular diseases, reduced lung function, postmenopausal type 2 diabetes, and a greater risk of all-cause mortality. And so what we wanted to see was, is diabetes a predictor of early menopause? Our rationale was twofold. The first was um, that the impact of premenopausal diabetes on age at natural menopause actually currently remains debated in the literature. So while some studies show a reduction, a significant, a significant reduction in age at actual menopause among diabetics, some actually show that there is no association there, while others show that this may be a diagnosis-based association. So um, those that are diagnosed with diabetes at, at a younger age may be more likely to have early menopause. Our second rationale was that there is currently incomplete evidence um, regarding um, uh, regarding this association, many studies have failed to adjust for important sociodemographic, behavioral, and clinical variables, and many others have been limited by very small sample sizes. And to the best of our knowledge, currently there is no study that looked at the association between gestational diabetes and age at natural menopause. So this leads me to our objective. Um, so we wanted to look at the association between premenopausal type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, gestational diabetes, and its association with age at natural menopause. Moving into methods, we used CLSA data. Um, so CLSA is one of the largest studies on aging in the world. Um, they have about 50,000 Canadian men and women um, at baseline, which were recruited between 2010 and 2015, uh, aged anywhere between 45 to 85 years. The study has two main cohorts, the tracking cohort and the comprehensive cohort. So the tracking cohort is a telephone-based survey, or else, uh, and it has 20,000 individuals. The comprehensive cohort, on the other hand, like its name suggests, is more comprehensive. It has 30,000 individuals. And so um, for comprehensive survey, you have a um, survey that is completed at home with a CLSA worker, and participants are recruited from around uh, 11 data collection sites across seven provinces uh, around Canada and they had to be within 25 to 50 kilometer radius. 
They then had to go into one of these data collection sites and have their biospecimens collected and have an in-depth physical exam. And so for our study, we use the comprehensive cohort. There are some exclusions that I wanted to note um, that CLSA made. Uh, this is very similar to other Canadian surveys. So individuals living on reserves or long-term institutions were excluded, full-time members of the Canadian Armed Forces, and those that did not speak uh, um, uh, one of the, uh, either one of the uh, official languages of Canada were excluded. So for our study, uh, we're moving into my study now. So for our study, there are some specific exclusions as well. And so we started with about 15,320 uh, females. Uh, we then excluded um, women who had a hysterectomy because in, in people who have uh, their uh, uterus taken out, which is his hysterectomy, uh, their menopausal status is unclear. Similarly, for those who had breast, ovarian, or other female genital organ cancers, we also excluded them because often in their treatment, um, it, uh, it, can, it can mask the age at which they reach uh, menopause because their treatments involve, involve hormones. And then anyone who did not give us enough information about either our exposure variable or our outcome uh, was excluded. Uh, this gave us a final sample of 11,436 females. So for our exposure assessment, um, this was premenopausal diabetes, which was assessed uh, via self-report uh, at baseline. We had four main categories that we divided our main exposure variable into, type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, gestational diabetes, and no diabetes, which was our reference category. Type 1 and type 2 diabetes were divided based on their age of diagnosis because we had that information. So just to make that a little bit more clear here, you can see that for my exposure uh, variable, there are four main categories. So no diabetes, gestational diabetes, type two and type one. But then because we had information on age of diagnosis for type two and type one, we were able to divide it um, further to see if that had an effect. So type two diabetics, uh, we had more of them. And so we were able to um, stratify them um, a little bit more. So we had less than 30 at age of diagnosis, 30 to 39, 40 to 49, uh, 50 or older. And then for type 1 diabetics, our sample was a little bit smaller, so we were only able to uh, categorize them into age groups, less than 30 and 30 and older. For our outcome assessment, it was basically age of natural menopause, which was treated as a continuous variable. We attained um, participants' menopausal status, uh, sorry, not me, uh, CLSA attained menopausal status um, first from participants, and then their age of uh, natural menopause, which was then used for our outcome. Covariates, we actually adjusted for a lot of covariates. Uh, I won't read them all, but uh, there were lots of sociodemographic variables, lifestyle factors, and premenopausal clinical factors as well that we adjusted for in our analysis. Moving into statistical analysis, we used survival analysis because this allowed us to include participants that had not yet reached menopause, so we were able to take their person years into consideration. So our primary outcome was age of natural menopause for postmenopausal women. And our secondary endpoints included age at interview for women who were not yet menopausal. And for women who had started hormone therapy, it was their age at initiation of hormone therapy because that can often, um, uh, yeah, it can often give us uh, un inconclusive results on when they actually reach their menopause. So we had kaplan meier curves, uh, which were used to ascertain the median age at natural menopause for different types of diabetes and Cox proportional hazard regression models where we had bivariate and multivariate exposure uh, association between our exposure variable and our outcome. So moving into results, this is our first table, which is basically highlighting the descriptives. So we had, um, we were able to add weights, which allowed us to um, make our study representative to the seven provinces of Canada where the participants were recruited from. So 91% of our sample was non-diabetic. Uh, 6.7 had gestational diabetes. This is very similar to the national averages as well. Uh, and we had 0.3% that were um, type 1 diabetics and around 2% had type 2 diabetes. So this is a kaplan meier curve. And as you can see over here, the two curves that you see are non-diabetics in the black and the dashed is uh, people having any type of diabetes. Uh, and over here, if you notice, um, this is um, the probability that a person will get um, their uh, menopause, and this is the age. So as you can see, the curves look very similar. And so if you were just to see this, um, you would say there isn't really a big difference there. Rather, if you were to notice the, the numbers over here, 
non-diabetics reached menopause at the age of 52, median age of 52, whereas all diabetics had a median age of 53. And so you'd be like, oh, uh, maybe rather all diabetics maybe reach menopause a little bit later. But um, in our Cox proportional, um, in our Cox analysis, Cox proportional uh, hazards analysis, we actually saw that those who were diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at an earlier age, so less than 30 years, they reached menopause earlier as compared to their non-diabetic uh, non counterparts. Similarly, with those who had type 2 diabetes early on, so between the ages of 30 and 39, they also reached menopause early. And then those who had type 2 diabetes after the age of 50 or at, at or after the age of 50 uh, were more likely to reach menopause at a later age as compared to non-diabetics. So moving into discussion, why do we see this pattern? And currently, there are very few clinical studies that are actually look at this. So um, a lot of it is hypothesis-based. Um, it's actually been seen that in type 1 diabetics, uh, they usually have an autoimmune disorder. And people who have an autoimmune disorder, they also tend to have others. And so um, in type 1 diabetics, it has been seen that they have um, more ovarian antibodies, self-reactive ovarian antibodies. Um, and also, uh, in preclinical studies, it's been seen that lower levels of insulin or suboptimal insulin therapy um, is actually associated with um, a greater uh, impairment of your egg ovulation and maturation and greater follicular apoptosis. Um, and then for type 2 diabetics, it's actually been seen that, um, you know, greater, uh, you know, having suboptimal glycemic control um, uh, where you're not taking care of your, of your blood sugar uh, can actually be um, associated with accelerated aging um, and, and cause um, and lead to reduced life expectancy. Uh, and so based on all of that, um, you know, we were thinking that somewhat uh, con like a conclusive, sorry, uh, and like a combined effect of bad insulin control, um, you know, bad um, glycemic control um, may be causing uh, this association. However, more studies are needed. Um, similarly, for later diagnosis uh, of type 2 diabetes and later age of natural menopause, um, we, were, we were not sure why this was the case, and so definitely needs uh, additional studies. Um, additionally, there was one study that was uh, published um, in 2015 by Brand and colleagues that actually showed um, that age of diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, sorry, age of diagnosis of any diabetes um, is um, so lower age of diagnosis is associated with early menopause. Later uh, diagnosis is associated with later menopause. However, they did not show uh, the different types of diabetes. That was an that was an addition that our study um, has made in the field. So, in terms of strengths and limitations, uh, we do have a lot of strengths. It, it, we had a large sample size. We carefully adjusted for a lot of covariates. Um, it is one of the first studies to look at gestational diabetes and age of natural menopause. We did not find an association there, um, but definitely one of the first studies according to um, our, our search um, to look at this association. And then we adjusted for a lot of premenopausal health conditions, um, which again uh, permitted for more clarity on the temporal sequence of events uh, and their impact on age at natural menopause. Having said that, there are some lim limitations. We did not have information on age of diagnosis for gestational diabetes. So it's possible that if you were to divide gestational diabetics on, uh, on the basis of their age of diagnosis, you may see a similar effect. Um, and uh, both diabetes and age of natural menopause was based on self-report. So, so it is um, susceptible to misclassification. And then finally, uh, CLSA did not collect information on oral contraceptive use, um, age of menarche, so first period, parity and breastfeeding. So we were not able to include those variables, even though they have been shown to be important uh, in previous studies. And so the significance of our study is that uh, we hope that we've made the first step towards understanding the association between diabetes and, and um, age of menopause. Um, and we hope that you know, uh, this can help clinicians in Canada and around the world direct more early and focused care towards at-risk patients. I would like to thank my supervisor, Dr. Halakini, my lab members, and also Hugh, um, who was my statistician, and he supported me a lot during my thesis, who is in the audience right now. Um, thank you, Hugh. <laughs> and that would be the end, so I can take some questions. 
Great. Thank you so much, uh, Rati. And uh, we've lost uh, Joa's uh, video. Perhaps she has a little one at home who uh, was pulling on her leg. No? Okay. Um, that seems to always happen during these webinars these days. So, um, so I welcome everyone to uh, put questions into the chat box. Um, if you have any either uh, about the content of presentations, um, the the research, or about the 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 process for uh, applying for data, which Ma Matilda can speak to. Um, so there is a question from Chris Wolfson. Uh, my question to both trainee presenters is, was there information that you would have liked to have that was not included in the CLSA? I can start with Brati. Sure. Thank you, Chris, for the question. It's a very important question. Um, when I first submitted my proposal, um, I thought there would be more of a bigger percentage of uh, non-whites in the CLSA. <laughs> I think it's 2% non-whites, uh, racial minorities and so on, and 98% whites. So even my my immigrants are, of, um, they, they report that they're white and maybe we have like, I don't know, 300 people that like look different. <laughs> I'm just saying that I would have loved more of diversity in the CLSA. I don't know if they can change that, but I don't think so. Um, and uh, the other thing is uh, I was I was planning to look at um, IBD, I think, in my first analysis, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, and that they haven't uh, you know, differentiated between Crohn's disease and so on. And I think they changed the questionnaire uh, when we commented on that and they, uh, for the next uh, few years, I think. Thank you. Yeah, right. thank you for that question, Chris. Uh, sorry, Jennifer. <laughs> um, I believe I did mention this at the end of my, my um, presentation and to Doa's point, I think that's a very good point. It would be nice to have a more diverse population for sure. Um, and uh, for my particular study, we did not have information on menarche, parity, breastfeeding. Um, some of these variables have been shown to be quite important when uh, it comes to age and natural menopause, and so it would have been it would have been nice uh, to have that information for sure. Great. Yes, there's always more information that uh, people are requesting of the CLSA, but I uh, uh, we have the the sample and the diversity is something that we have heard before as well. So, but that's, that's great feedback. Um, just before uh, people start to, we're not done yet, so don't worry about that. Um, but the poll, the evaluation poll was uh, put up. So if you have, uh, before you leave, if you have to leave before one o'clock, if you can please take a, a few minutes to complete that feedback poll. Um, so there is a, another question from Teresa Pauly. Um, some other national panel data sets such as uh, um, HRS allow for researchers to submit ideas for experimental modules or the addition of questionnaires. Is that possible at the CLSA as well? Matilda, did you want to take that or do you want me to take that? <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Jennifer. It would be better if you'd answer this. Yeah, I, I mean, I think really from from my perspective, the answer is, um, you know, we we have a process where we have uh, working groups come together at during each of our waves to identify um, areas in our questionnaires and our data collection procedures that are either um, not being used or uh, have become less important, or there could also be areas that could become um, important as well. So um, I think if you have any um, I think in terms of experimental modules, I think that idea hasn't, I, I can't speak to it specifically, but that hasn't been um, uh, used. But the idea of adding different modules and questionnaires definitely has been, and, and this, the CLSA questionnaires have changed from wave to wave. Um, for example, adding a, a elder abuse uh, module, which was early on in baseline, was removed and is now being um, put back in. And so um, I think anything's possible. And I think if you have those sorts of questions, you can um, address them either if you know one of the PIs, you could address it that way, or of course, through our, our uh, 
uh, data access officer who would get that filtered to the right place. So it all starts with a question, right? Um, so hopefully that answers that question. Um, one question that I think I'll just pose since we were, um, you know, we wanted to highlight some of the trainee projects that are um, completed successfully, uh, but also the four trainees, what what it looks like to actually apply for and, and use CLSA data. So I'm wondering if you can, um, and then I have a follow-up question for you, Matilda, so you're not gonna get off scot-free. Um, you know, just like how, what was your experience like in terms of applying for the data? Um, you know, was it, uh, you know, just what was your general experience? What would you say to other trainees? Um, and then of course, if you have any um, advice, feel free to uh, to uh, provide that as well. Do you wanna go first? <laughs> I can go first, that's okay. Um, my experience was actually great. Um, uh, I, I uh, knew from the beginning that I wanted to get um, data from CLSA. Um, it's so nice to have a Canadian study that, that is looking at you know, aging. Um, so it was great. And I thought the instructions were very clear. I think what Matilda said in the beginning of the presentation, which was, you know, take six months um, before, like say, tell yourself that you're gonna have six months till the time you're gonna get your data fully in your hand. And, and so take that into consideration when you're writing your proposal and you're thinking about your study and you're coming up with your objective and uh, your, your stats. Um, uh, it, it's, it's very good to know that, um, you know, that time, it, it took me less than that, um, but it's good to give yourself that much time. Um, and then the data is, is very well um, uh, displayed and, and very easy to work with. Uh, so, so yeah. I, yeah, that's that's all I would say. <laughs> um, I can say the same thing as well. Um, I would like to thank all the support uh, from uh, from the CLSA team. They answer the the emails quite fast, and uh, I think I, I've got, I think most of my PhD on on CLSA data. Even though I did work on NHANES data before, NHANES was much more complicated. Mm -hmm. Different types of you know, have to download several ones and so on. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm proud. I'm, I'm proud that uh, we have a mm -hmm. Canadian base like that. And I hope in the future we get a more diverse uh, yeah. that, uh, data set. <laughs> okay. Great. Thanks for that feedback. Um, and Matilda, one question that I had had for you, I'm totally putting you on the spot for this one, but I know we've talked about the data access a, a lot and uh, how trainees can, and others, of course, can apply for data. I'm wondering if you can just speak very briefly to um, what it means when, so uh, people get their data, researchers get their data, you use it, uh, you publish, but what does the the tail end of the process look like in terms of um, requirements for uh, a data use? For example, final reports or things yeah, like that? Sure. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, I can go to this. Uh... Or did I, did yeah. I, did I miss something? Did you know, actually, uh, yeah, actually, the, yeah. So the data, I mean, once we release the data, so it depends on the time frame that was agreed in the access agreement. So. Uh, uh, at, by the end of the access agreement, definitely they should, uh, all researchers, including trainees, they need to submit a final report. Oops. I think we may have lost Matilda, unless it's me that's uh, glitching at this point. Yeah, I think it's probably Matilda. So. Um, yeah, I'll just jump in here. I don't know now the slides are all moving around, uh, but yeah, so I, I'll, I probably shouldn't try to finish because I'm know very little about uh, Matilda's role, but there is a, uh, depends on timelines and there are requirements as part of the data access agreements that we hope that all researchers, whether trainee or, um, you know, non trainee um, can abide by and that we, we do ask for, um, you know, some sort of a very brief final report. Um, and that that also helps us to um, um, understand what research outputs are being um, created from from the data that is being made available for the CLSA. So um, it's very useful to sort of so we sort of try to follow projects all through that process. So uh, yeah, uh, I don't see any final questions. But if you do have any final questions, you can reach out to either of the uh, either of the three presenters today. Um, so I'd like to, in closing, thank every 
thank our presenters again. Uh, we appreciate your participation in the CLSA, using the CLSA data as well as participating in this webinar series. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that CLSA data access request applications are ongoing. And as Matilda noted, the next deadline is April 14th of this year. Um, you can visit the CLSA website under data access to review the available data um, and further information on the data access process. Um, I'd also like to remind everyone to complete their survey if possible under the polling option. If you don't see it under the chat button, you can you can click the drop down arrow that's uh, in the same place. Uh, today is the last day to apply for the summer program in aging, um, which is SPA 2021 for short. Grad students and postdocs uh, interested in longitudinal studies on aging are encouraged to apply for this. Um, and you can get more information by visiting the CIHR Research Net website. Uh, and for our upcoming CLSA web webinar, which will be in March, the uh, following up on DOA's presentation, um, it's uh, mental health outcomes among men and without a history of prostate cancer diagnosis in Canada, a silent epidemic in cancer survivorship. And this will be presented by Louise Moody and Dr. Gabriela Ilia of Dalhousie University. And you can visit our CLSA website under webinars to find out more about that. And finally, the CLSA promotes the webinar series using the hashtag CLSA webinar. And we invite you to follow us on Twitter and also tweet these sorts of things out. So thank you again for attending today's uh, presentation and webinar. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in March. And uh, Matilda's back. So uh, yeah. thank you, all of you. That's okay. I, I'm sorry that you. internet was off. <laughs> I'm really sorry for this. It happened. It was bound to happen, right? So. Yeah. Okay. Thank okay, you. So everyone. I think that's thank all. You, Thank okay, you, thank you everyone. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you.